So diving right into it, the 10 pieces of advice, the number one piece of advice that pretty much 100% of all of the families gave me is blah, blah, blah. And many times the response to hearing that we should be making blah is that, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, we should be praying, but really get to the meat of it. Give me the meat and bones of what actually should we be doing beyond blah. And if that's our response to hearing that advice, we really need to kind of hit the pause button, button and take a moment and self-reflect. Because if we think that there's any success possible in raising our children, that doesn't come directly from Allah subhanahu wa then we're misguiding ourselves. So everything starts first and foremost with the law. Turn, purifying our intentions, begging Allah for help, asking Him for His mercy, asking Him for His guidance, asking Him for His protection. And many of these parents told me that not only did they rely on the law, but their children saw them. Constantly relying on blood, relying on turning to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they told me that anytime they had to make big decisions regarding their lives, their children's lives, they went to Salah al Sahara, the prayer of guidance. And their children saw them first and foremost turning to Salah al Sahara before making big decisions. Anytime there was a need that they had, whether they wanted their children to do well on exams or whether they were hoping for a cure health report from the doctor, they would turn to saw the hajjah, the prayer of me. Um, anytime they saw blessings emerge in their lives, they would turn to Islam the shukr, the prayer of gratitude. So there was this attitude in the home that the children witnessed growing up, which is that first and foremost, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa before we ask anybody else for any kind of help. Okay, so the second piece of advice these parents gave me is that one of the things pretty much every parent prayed for was sofa companionship. And they said that your sofa, your companionship, will bring you for break. And my, my mom used to say to us that don't think that you're better than your friends. You are who your friends are. And so these parents would go out of their way to become friends with like-minded families with families who they admired the way they were raising their children and forged these friendships so that their children had beneficial support in their lives. And some of the friends, some of the parents talked about even changing their circles of friends if they realized that the community that they were living in or that they were socializing in, that the way their time was being spent and the things that their children were being exposed to were not necessarily the most positive. And they weren't necessarily what they wanted to see in their own children as their children grew up, then those parents actually made drastic decisions to change their entire circle of friendship and bring in the friends that they felt were going to be um, role models for their children. So, when it comes to um, Sofa, we have uh, an imam in the Bay Area called Sheikh Rabin Bakri. He gave a really good piece of advice. He said that your children are being influenced in three aspects of their lives. They're being influenced in the street, which is basically where they're socializing. So their social media, the streets, their friends. So they're being influenced in the street, they're being influenced in the school, and they're being influenced in the home. The street, the school, and the home. And he said that you have to be winning in two out of three of those areas. So to street, school, and home, two of those areas is where you should be the prominent, the predominant influence in your children's lives. And a book that I would like to recommend that can help you get the tools on how to be uh, a primary influence in your children's lives is a book called Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Cures. Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Cures. And that book is written by a man named Gabor Mate. His last name is called M-A-T-E. And that book gives really good tips on how to forge a relationship with your children so that your children will actually, inshallah, prefer your company over social media, over friends, over popular culture. One other thing that I saw with these families, which is a blessing that not all of us have, but those of you who do have children, very, very grateful for it, 
is um, families that had grandparents in the home. I saw that there was an exceptional level of other in those families because there's something about children growing up realizing that they have to look out for the needs of somebody other than themselves that goes very far in teaching them selflessness and teaching them service. And that comes when you have to worry about, like, we're not going to start eating until our grandmother is sitting at the table, or my grandfather needs his hand held while we're walking to the car or going to the restroom or whatever. But the fact that these kids learn that they have to look out for someone other than themselves, because in the culture that we're in today, it's a lot of thinking, right? Looking out for ourselves. And so having grandparents in the home, as long as, inshallah, it's a functional relationship, it's a respectful relationship, the children-in-law, the parents-in-law, inshallah, get along and treat each other with other, and the kids grow up with uh, an extra level of other as well. And, oh, by the way, just going back to the beginning, when I wrote this article um, and I started interviewing families about what impressed me with their kids, just to give you an idea of the things that were impressing me about these children. So when in the article, when I say raising children with eating and vinia, the, I don't mean to suggest that eating and vinia are equal, because they're not. Dunya, we know, is the world we life, and being is our spiritual matters or religious matters. And religion always, always supersedes everything else. But many times, people tend to think that it's binary, it's either one or the other. You're either going to have your kid who's going to be doing really well in school, succeeding in sports, and getting ahead in the world, but then, you know, prayers like hit or miss, um, you know, Islamic education is kind of put on the back burner, or people will think that families are completely immersed in religious matters, but are neglecting, like, maybe the educational path that their kids should be focusing on. So with these kids, what I saw is that there seemed to be a really good balance between excelling in academics, excelling in sports, excelling in their career path, but at the same time, striving for that same level of excellence, if not higher, when it comes to the religion as well. So I just, um, it's important to define terms and explain what we're striving for, so I wanted to make that clear that this is, these were the role models that I was looking for. Kids who were doing well in the video, but also were really, much less striving for high goals in the village. Okay, so we talked about the duas, relying on the power of prayer, and then sofa, how your sofa companionship will make your breakthrough. So the third thing that came up with these families is that when it comes to sofa, who could be the best companion? Who could be the best sofa for our children? And what I saw in these families is that there was a very close relationship and a close love with the Prophet And the Prophet was a living, breathing reality in these families' lives. He wasn't somebody relegated to ministry books. He wasn't somebody just kept for Sunday school. He wasn't somebody from the ancients. He was somebody relevant and he was somebody who was real. And these families talked about the prophets of God as some on a regular basis. The way you might talk about a grandparent that your children never got to meet. Like, for example, I never met my maternal grandfather. He passed away before my parents could not marry. But growing up, my mother always talked about it. And the love and respect was very, very evident. And when he would do well in school, she would say things like, oh, you know, Papa was alive. He'd be so proud of me. We really, really admire children who do well in school, and that that would make us happy to think that if our grandfather was alive, he would have been pleased with us. So that same attitude, except about the prophet. And so there are different ways that the families brought the prophets and mothers and them into, the, into the children's lives. Um, one is that they talked about it with a sense of joy and a sense of excitement. So for example, one mom told me that when uh, on Fridays she would have the kids bake a special treat, right, out of honor of Mr. Jerobah. And um, but then she would tell the kids, you know the prophets of God is and we love squash. So how about we make pumpkin muffins today? Or um, the 
customers sort of love dates or love honey. How about we make date cookies or honey bars? Um, the profits of love is about the color green or the color white. How about we wear our green clothes today or we wear our white clothes? So very gently mentioning him and bringing him into the children's lives so that they were thinking about him on a regular basis. <clears throat> I once was visiting my sister's home and her son at that time was seven years old and I saw a book sitting next to his bed and it was a, a yellow book published by Ikara Publishers, and um, it's in Shema Imam, The Life of Perfection. And it's a book written by Imam Dermid in the ninth century, I mean, ancient text, but it had been translated into English, and it had been done for children, and it was sitting um, next to my nephew Mustafa's bed. And so I asked my sister about that. I said, oh, what's this? What's this book? Tell me about this. And she said, oh, that? That's just, it's called Shema which means characteristics. And she said, that's just a compilation of hadith that describes different characteristics of the Prophet And every night before Mustafa goes to bed, his father, Masood, reads him one hadith, just one hadith. No big long lecture, no big discussion, just going over one hadith before Mustafa falls asleep. And she said, you know, the fact that Mustafa knows that the Prophet like to eat dates and cucumbers together, makes him feel like he knows the prophet. So like I said. And the truth is that you can't love somebody until you actually know them, right? So it's really important that our children grow up knowing who the prophet was and is. Um, when our children were little, we asked Imam Zay Chakir, this is when our boys were in preschool, um, we asked Imam Zay Chakir, what should we be teaching our children? And he just, without any hesitation, he said, teach them Sita, and teach them nasheeds. So Sita's biography of the Prophet and nasheeds are songs that were sung in praise of him. And when my kids were little, we had Musa Islam and Zawad Warren's Ali, mashallah, and Allah reward them for what they've, for the beauty they've provided us in this field. However, now there's so many artists who flooded the, the market, mashallah, with beautiful songs, and there's a lot of options out there now. And so, you know, I've seen two years old and three year old children sitting in their car seats who are singing the sheets right along with the, the radio. And I've seen three year old, uh, a three year old boy who, when he's getting strapped into his car seat, he can recite the uh, prayer for traveling. So there, that's another thing that was important with learning about the prophets of the Islam to learn about all the different sunnahs. There's some basic sunnah laws that all children should be taught. And it's taught through repetition. So the the dua for traveling in the car, the dua for entering the restroom, the dua for leaving the restroom, the dua for entering the home, the dua for leaving the home. One dad told me that he just printed out the duas in English and um, put them up all over the house in different areas, and they would recite them every time they passed those cards. And over time, the kids ended up memorizing. One anecdote that I want to share um, on this topic of loving the prophets of Islam. This is something that um, I actually witnessed myself. There was a, a mom who uh, she got up a little late for Fajr. Like Fajr was still in, but it's about to go out in like 10 minutes. So she didn't want to spend her time trying to get her eight-year-old out of bed to pray Fajr. And so she took care of her own Fajr and Fajr time went out. And the eight-year-old, when he woke up and he realized that he had missed Fajr, he actually burst into tears. And he was crying because his mom hadn't woken him up for Fajr. And the <clears throat> in-laws who were visiting at the time were horrified actually by his response because they were like, what have you been teaching our grandchild? Like, why is this frightened? Does he think he's gonna burn in hell? Like, no eight-year-old should be this upset about missing prayer. And they thought it was coming from a place of fear. And anxiety, but actually when they talked to the eight-year-old, it came out that what was making him cry was that he knew that the last thing the prophets of Madison talked about before he passed away was the prayer. And that his last words were the prayer, the prayer, hold on to the prayer. And this eight-year-old knew that from learning to see that. And so for him, it was a feeling of letting the prophets of Madison down and neglecting something that was very, very important. And so the mom learned her lesson, and she was like, yeah, I'm never going to 
uh, not wake my child up for budget again. But it was it was a beautiful example of coming to prayer, coming to a lesson on a bella from a position of love instead of a position of fear. All children need to learn love and fear of a lot. But in the early years, it's all about love. And there was nobody who loved them. Uh, loved Allah subhanahu wa more than the prophets. So teaching your children to love the prophets of Allah and Salaam, what can Shalba teach them to love Allah Okay, so I'm sorry my PowerPoint presentation wasn't downloading, so I'll just review. So the first one was Duas, the second one was your Sahba, the third one was that the prophets of Allah and Salaam was a living, breathing reality in these children's lives. The fourth tip, that these parents told me is that having fun wasn't haram in our home, but we made the home environment as halal as possible. I'll repeat that one more time. Having fun wasn't haram in our home, but we made the home environment as halal as possible. And another way to paraphrase that is beware of the dangers of don't. Beware of the dangers of don't. Children should not be growing up constantly hearing, no, 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 no. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. No, that's haram. No, Allah doesn't like that. No, we're not allowed to do that. If we use a little bit of creativity, it can it can be flipped. And we can um, guide our children in the direction we want them to go to while using the words yes, right? So, um, so for exa um, some examples I saw in my community was um, like, I personally have no opinion about celebrating birthdays and not passing couplets, nothing like that. But I know, uh, I know the mom who doesn't celebrate birthdays for their own philosophical reasons. But she and her family went above and beyond throwing the most lavish celebrations when her children would memorize, um, like when they memorize Jazama, um, when they memorize the 29th uh, Jaz. I still remember, my children still remember the, the party she threw. She has twin children who both went on to become a father, mashallah, daughter and son. But um, when they memorized the 30th Jaz, she had a Full on party in the park with two separate cakes, and everybody got party favors. But it was honoring and celebrating something that she felt was worthy of honoring and celebrating. And I know my kids left that party motivated and inspired and wanting to achieve similar types of goals. So, um, so that was an example of she didn't say, No, you can't have birthday parties. She said, Yes, we're going to have parties. We're going to celebrate when you guys do X, Y, and Z, and, and everybody can figure out whatever those goals are. I know moms who throw in hijab parties for their daughters when they come of age, where um, all the ladies and aunties in the community come together, give beautiful hijabs, and, um, and give wonderful advice to young ladies as they take on that act of um, ibadah. I know of people who have um, celebrated their kids' seventh birthday because that's the year they're going to take on praying. So the whole part of birthday party becomes focused around prayer. It becomes a salah party where um, it was, uh, what were some of the games I saw at the salah party? Like pin the moon over the, the mosque, I think was one. And they had a, a prayer, uh, a misbaha making station where kids make their own misbahas. Um, so you know, people get creative on how, how they can have fun with their kids. One little caveat that I'm going to give, uh, this, this little topic can be an entire talk on its own, so I'm not going to go very in-depth into it, but I just, if there's nothing else that anybody takes from this talk except the power of blood, this one other thing that I want to share with you, inshallah, I'll consider this inshallah success. So these parents, even though they made sure to give their children a lot of yeses instead of no's, one thing that these parents, every single one of them was on board with and on the same page about is that they did not allow their children to have access to the internet in the privacy of their bedrooms. So if that's the only thing anyone takes from this talk, it, it will be a huge blessing. Not having access to the internet and the privacy of your bedrooms. And I won't really go more, I won't go deeper into that topic other than that. 
Okay, the fifth tip. Uh, a lot of these kids, what they shared with me when I asked them to give me advice on what their parents did well with them, they said our parents didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk. Our parents didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk. Meaning that their parents weren't hypocrites or they didn't see their parents as hypocrites. And I know Stella Rania a lot said that children listen with their eyes. Children listen with their eyes. Meaning that you can give them all the lectures you want, but if you're doing something different than what you're saying, nobody sniffs out hypocrisy quicker than children. So if you're telling your children you shouldn't do Reba, then they hear you do Reba about a family member. Or if they, if you tell your children you should have supper, but then they see you losing your temper over some small inconvenience, kids are learning from that. And so um, I, I know of one young man who told me that he remembers seeing his father weep when his father inadvertently missed a prayer. And he said, seeing my father weep when he missed a prayer taught me more about the importance of prayer than all the lectures in the world, seeing the way his father responded um, to that act of moment of negligence. Um, Sheikh Yohani Keller says that children need to see that Islam worked in the home. They need to see that Islam actually benefits them and actually works. That Islam is the reason that parents speak to each other with respect. Islam is the reason that the home is a calm environment. Islam is the reason that everybody's clean and smells good. Uh, Islam is the reason that we make choices that give us lives of dignity. So when children see that Islam actually works and gives you a life of peace and dignity, then inshallah, inshallah, they will choose it for themselves one day when they're older. And obviously we want our children to choose the theme because they recognize it as hub, right? We want our children to choose Islam because they recognize But many people when they get turned off the religion, it's because they see that it didn't actually work in their lives. It didn't bring them benefit. Um, when it comes to talking the talk, uh, sorry, walking the walk, not just talking the talk, we also have to be mindful about the kinds of the kind of language and vocabulary and words that we use when we talk about religion. Um, one example from my own life is when um, my kids were little and I was working on a project with another mom, uh, the time for Maghrib came in. And I, without thinking really deeply about it, I just said to her, oh, you know, I need to go get Maghrib out of the way. And she was kind of startled for a second and then she just smiled and she said, oh, that's interesting. In our home, we say we need to get Maghrib in the way. Such a huge difference that one word makes, right? I need to get prayer out of the way. I need to get prayer in the way. Just the way we approach um, our religion, the kids pick up on that attitude. And Ansa Tamra Gray, she said that, you know, in Islam, um, when we give charity, we're supposed to give charity to our right hand in such a way that our left hand doesn't find that, right? But she says that when it comes to children, you give with your right hand, but with your left hand, you pull your child forward and you say, look, look what they're doing. So, that they, so don't hide your acts of ibadah. Share with your children when they're little so that they learn that this is how they do it, right? Okay, the sixth tip uh, that these parents shared is they said, I wasn't afraid to be the bad guy, but I didn't behave badly. I wasn't afraid to be the bad guy, but I didn't behave badly. That means that these parents were friendly with their children, but they didn't try to be their best friends. Because your best friend is not going to tell you you need to brush your teeth. Your best friend is not going to tell you that you need to do your prayers. Your best friend is not going to tell you that it's time to go to bed, right? Parents do that, authority figures do that. But they have friendly relationships with their children. There's three types of parenting out there. 
there's um, authoritarian parenting, which is called brick wall parenting, which is like, it's my way or the highway. If you don't listen to me, you're going to see the back of my hand. Only my rules matter, right? Me as the adult, I'm the only one who matters. Nobody else has a voice. Then there's permissive parenting, which is called jellyfish parenting. That's where parents don't have a spine and they're very weak, and they're always whining, and they're always telling their children, please, honey, listen to me. Why don't you listen to me? How many times do I have to tell you? You know, you, telling your kids, if you do that one more time, we're going to leave. I'm telling you, if you do that one more time, we're going to leave. And then the child does it, and they don't leave. And they say, what do I do with my child? He or she never listens to me. Not getting up and leaving, right? So, that's jellyfish parenting, permissive parenting. The third type of parenting, which is considered to be the best type of parenting, is called authoritative parenting. That's called backbone parenting. It's where parents say what they mean and they mean what they say. And an excellent book um, by an author that I heard, I believe this boss has had him come out and speak as well, by Dr. Leonard Sachs. I recommend every book by Dr. Leonard Sachs. His last name is called SAX. Um, I have three sons, so I've read his books about raising boys. Um, boys Adrift is an excellent, excellent book. Um, for girl, parents of girls, there's a book called Girls on the Edge. But a book that he wrote that will inshallah, teach you how to be an authoritative parent is a book called The Collapse of Parenting. It was a New York Times bestseller, and um, it's a book that everyone should have in their library. Okay, the seventh tip these parents shared is the, all these parents told me that I always kept my kids close by. I always kept my kids close by. And because I was a stay-at-home mom and I homeschooled, we homeschooled our sons up until eighth grade, a lot of people assume that that's what I'm talking about, that I'm saying, oh, you have to homeschool your kids. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What, what these parents did share with me, every single one of them, and I know everybody's situations are different, so this is, I'm not, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings or to freak anyone out or to make anyone feel like they're being judged. I'm just sharing the data that I collected from speaking to all these families. But every single one of these families told me that we didn't put our children in daycare, that our children were not in daycare from like 7 in the morning until 5 in the evening non-Muslim caregivers. Um, sometimes, some of these families had nannies to help them. Some of them had grandparents in the home to help them. Some of them had Muslim aunties in the community who watched their children. Um, a few of these families actually had a stay-at-home dad while the mom worked. Um, but the primary caregiving and therapia of the children was done by the parents, parents or grandparents. Somebody invested in the children. And somebody Muslim, with Muslim adab and Muslim rules and Muslim guidelines. So that was across the board. Um, another very common rule that was not very popular with the children um, is many of these parents told me that they didn't do sleepovers, that they didn't allow their children to go and sleep in a home where they could go check on their bed in the middle of the night. But the way they would compromise with their kids, being creative with that, saying yes instead of no, is that they would allow sleepovers in their home. And they would, you know, throw big fun sleepover parties so that their kids could have their friends there. Some of the exceptions that some of these families made is if they knew that all the men would be gone from the home, no fathers, no brothers, no sons in the home, then maybe girls would be allowed to stay, spend the night in a home where there were only girls. Sometimes people did sleepovers where the parents got to sleep over as well. But the idea of having your child in somebody else's home in a bed that you can't go check on in the middle of the night, that was a big no-no for pretty much all of these families. Okay, the eighth tip. We didn't spoil our kids, nor did we praise them too much. We didn't spoil our kids, nor did we praise them too much. Um, what that indicates is that these families, while they were concerned about their children's academic education, and they were concerned about 
their physical education. They were also very, very concerned about how their nafs was also developing, their egos. And so um, one example that stands out in my head is um, in the Bay Area, we have an Islamic school there called North Star. And every year in the month of Rabi Lawal, North Star does a national uh, poetry competition where they pick a theme every year about the Prophet, and they encourage children from all over the country, all schoolers, kids who go to Islamic schools, kids who go to public schools, to submit poems, original poems that they've written based on that theme. And then the poems are judged, and North Star has their annual fundraiser, and hundreds of people are there. And then on the stage, they announce who the winner is, you know, whose poem got chosen as first place. And so one year, one of our students from our home school, Guam, Ultry, she won the first place prize for her poem. We were very proud of her. And in, at that time, I was in charge of an uh, event that was happening at our local mosque in the month of the local. So I asked her mom if it would be possible for her daughter to come recite that poem at our event. And this mom is a mom I really, really admire a lot, I've taken a lot of notes from the way she raised her children. But what stood out for me is that her mom didn't automatically jump at the opportunity and say, yes, of course. Like I think any one of us would be very proud and very excited to have our child recite a poem about the prophets and love is in public. But what she said to me was, you know, my daughter's been getting a lot of praise for that poem. She, uh, her name was announced at the fundraising event. She was called up on stage in front of hundreds of people. And she said, and then she happens to be in this one particular science program. And this week, the science program was meeting at a ranch and KQED, one of our local PBS stations, happened to be there filming a documentary. And they ended up interviewing her on camera for their science program. And that TV show is gonna be airing on, on television next week. She said, you know, I just don't think it's good for her notes. I don't think it's good for her ego to be in the spotlight so much. So if you don't mind, we're actually going to say no. And that was a huge teaching moment for me because I realized that the mom was looking at something much deeper and concerned about something much deeper and looking long-term. And her daughter has now grown on grown up to do amazing things, graduated from a great university, has a great job, is uh, a role model to many, many people, but she's very, very humble. And there are many people who in their place would have a very big head, but she doesn't. And I, I realize that it's because of the mindful way that her parents, Ashwala, raised her. So that's just one example. Okay, the ninth tip. Talk to your kids with love. Talk to your kids with love. And so what many of these families told me is that it's really important to them to teach, their, for them to teach their children to look at the world around them with the eye of discernment, to kind of look at the deeper messages, the deeper lessons behind things. But to do that in a way that doesn't become lecturing, that doesn't become nagging, that doesn't become didactic all the time, right? Where they're just, anytime a kid wants to do something fun, they're just getting a lecture about it, right? There's a fine line that we have to walk. And so it was important to these parents to be part of the fun with their kids, but at the same time, teaching their kids to think at a deeper level. So like, for example, um, I have a couple of different examples. So. One is like, I know a family where a dad wasn't thrilled with the movie Frozen, right? And Frozen came out a few years ago as a Disney movie. It was very popular. Every single child in America was singing the songs from that movie. So the dad didn't love that movie. And um, I don't have the lyrics written down, but in particular, uh, the song Let It Go, right? And, but the dad did not forbid his children from watching Frozen. He, let them watch Frozen, but he watched it with them and he enjoyed it with them. But then he discussed it with them as well. So for those of you who don't know the story of Frozen, it's, you know, just a quick synopsis is this girl is in charge of her sister, taking care of her sister. And the whole time she's taking care of her sister, she looks stressed out, she's buttoned up, she looks anxious, 
She looks like she's a very unhappy person. And then at some point in the movie, she decides to let it go, right? And the lyrics of the song literally say, let it go, let go of the rules, the rules don't matter anymore. And after that, she's living in this castle and she's in a sleeveless gown and she's no longer taking care of her sister. She's like abandoned her. So the dad talked to the kids about that, you know, like, what does that mean to let it go? I know one mom talked to her daughter about, well, what does it mean to be of service to people? Like she was being of service to her sister, but the movie shows her as being very unhappy when she was being of service. How, what's the Islamic approach to being of service to people? And the dad talked to his kids about what, what does it mean to let go of rules? What would it look like in our lives if we let go of rules? Do we have rules we follow? What's Sharia? Why is Sharia in our lives, right? And what would our life look like if we let go of rules? So again, letting the kids enjoy the movie, but at the same time, having a discussion and getting them to think about maybe some of the deeper messages um, that society is giving them. In my own life, I, uh, again, just doing things mindlessly, I, um, my kids, when they were little, it started to rain. And you know, I started singing to them the song that we all grew up with, which was Rain, Rain, Go Away, Sean and me want to play, come again another day, Rain, Rain, Go Away. Right? That was the song we all heard when we were kids. But my brother happened to be there when I was singing that to my boys. And my brother was like, Don't teach them that. Rain is a blessing, especially in California. Rain is a blessing. We need rain. So he's like, Why are you teaching them to reject all those blessings? Just because they want to have fun, is just because their nuts wants to go out and play, like they should be rejecting that less mercy, a less blessing. And so I was like, oh, I didn't really think of it that way. I didn't think of it that deeply. And so we played around with the lyrics and we came up with our own song. And the song that we sang to our kids was Rain, Rain, come on down, come and fall upon the ground. Rain, rain, come down fast, come and make some green grass. Rain, rain, pour, 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 your mercy from our Lord. Rain, rain, fall on me, I turn to Allah gratefully. So we would sing that to our kids every time it rained. And I saw this with my own eyes, that one day I was going to take my boys on a picnic, and they were really excited, and they were going to see their friends, and it rained. And we got rained out, we weren't able to go on the picnic. And I still remember my boys standing at the sliding bus door, looking out at all the rain, disappointed. And then I saw my older son turn to his younger brother and say, it's okay, I mean, Allah's being kind to us. California needs the rain. We'll, we'll go on a picnic another day. And I remember being very moved by that because I knew I, I was convinced that that attitude that he had towards his disappointment, I think it came from that subtle brainwashing that had been happening for so long, so long with this song. Because the natural inclination would be to be like, why is this happening? Why, why, is, why are my plans getting messed up, right? And if the messaging I had been giving them for years is rain, rain, go away, we want to play, then I think it, you know the response would have been very different. So that's just a little examples of, um, you know, Chella, talking to your kids with love and, and hopefully teaching them to look at things with the eye of discernment. Um, one female scholar, uh, she did say that you do, you do want to be wary of falling into the trap of over-respecting your children or over-talking to your children. Like, Every single thing that you have to do should not have to be explained to them. Sometimes it's okay for parents to just say, because I said so. And kids need to be okay with that as well. And so just making sure you have that balance. Oh, and when it comes to talking to kids with love, one thing every parent should know, kids should not be crying themselves to sleep. If they've gotten in trouble with you, if you've gotten upset with them, if they've disappointed you, you can let them know. But before they go to sleep, they should be reassured that they are loved, that tomorrow is a fresh day, that everybody gets another chance, and we all make mistakes, and that they're safe, and they're loved, and they're accepted. Every kid should be getting that messaging. No one should be going to sleep on wet pillows, right? So what that means is parents have to be willing to reassure their children that they're okay, and they also have to be willing to apologize. If you mess up, and we all mess up, 
we all mess up. If you lose your temper, if you make some, you know, a bad choice in how you deal with your kids, it's okay to say I'm sorry. And, and I'm sorry that I made you feel X, Y, and Z way. If you're going to teach your children how to apologize in the future to people in their lives. And you're also going to teach them how to repent for Allah if, if you also are able to ask for forgiveness. Okay, the last tip. And this is the tip that causes the most tears. And again, it's not to make anybody feel bad. It's just data that I've collected, but it has come up again and again and again. The, the number 10 tip that pretty much all of these families shared with me is that they, the children had a pious father who engaged them. That's the key part. Being pious was not enough. They had a pious father who engaged them, meaning they took an interest in their children. They were invested in them. They were involved in their lives. They talked to them. They knew who their friends were. Um, they knew what made them sad. They knew what made them happy. They did things with them, activities with them. So for the longest time, when I used to do this talk, I used to say, I don't have science to back me up. This is just data I've collected from talking to people. But now I actually do have science to back me up. There is a man named Vern Bankston who did this landmark 30-year study. He started in 1972 and he ended in 2004, where he followed 2,000 people for 30 years. And he would meet up with them every few years. And the whole goal of his study was to find out what is it that these Christian and Jewish families are doing that is causing the next generation to continue being Christian and Jewish. And there were a lot of different factors he found, but the overwhelming factor was that the next generation had fathers who were practicing Jews and Christians. It wasn't enough for the mother to be a practicing Jew and Christian. So like if the mom was taking the kids to church on Sunday, but the dad was staying home and watching football, it was hit or miss if whether the kids were gonna grow up to be Christian. But when the dad was involved and was taking the kids to Sunday school, was in their Bible classes with them, then it was more likely that the next generation was going to continue to practice Christianity and Judaism. And this is what the Muslim families have said to me as well. And um, I, I know of a, a young boy who, one of, the, one of the kids in our community, when they spent the night at his house, they commented that um, they've seen in all the different homes, families have different ways of practicing. So in one family, the kid might get up and pray Fajr with his dad in Jamaat. Um, but he mentioned this one particular boy, and he said, you know, in his home, his dad just comes in to the bedroom, and he says, Ali, Fajr. And Ali jumps out of bed, and they go to the masjid. And I was really impressed when he told me that, right? And I was like, oh, wow, I mean, that's not easy to get up in the cold and go out in the dark and go to the masjid for Fajr. And this boy, Ali, has such a good attitude about being at Mashallah. And the little boy who was sharing this with me, he said, yeah, but you know what Ali's dad does? After Fajr prayer, every day, he takes Ali to Starbucks for breakfast. So I think that's why Ali's jumping out of bed. So I don't know. We don't know. We don't know what's causing Ali to jump out of bed. But what I do know about that dad is that he had decided it was worth it to him. He had a budget. It's not cheap. It's like four or five bucks a day, you know, times 30, so like 150 bucks a month. He took his kid out for a treat at Starbucks after Budger Prayer. And this kid was associating Budger as this beautiful bonding time with his dad. And uh, mashallah, he's an adult now. And I, I know he takes other young adults too. He picks them up in his car and takes them to Fudger Prayer. It's something he's held on to. And it's something he grew up you know, seeing from his dad. And we know that even from Hadith, right? That the, the Bedouin who came to the Prophet's mother, and he saw the Prophet's mother, and he saw his grandchildren. And he said, I have 10 children and I've never kissed any of them. And the Prophet said, is there anything I can do once Allah has removed mercy from your heart. So, um, you know, fathers having um, mercy on their children, it shows up. I, I know of a young woman who grew up in a small town where there were virtually no Muslims, but her father is a very, very pious man, a very calm man. And she and her siblings grew up to be amazing Muslims. And I once asked her, like, 
how did you guys not get sucked in by the siren call of the culture around you in this small town? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, when you feel love in the home, you don't look for it anywhere else. When you feel love in the home, you don't look for it anywhere else. So, and she felt that love from her father in particular. So for single moms, what's gonna be really important is um, having male mentors in your kids' lives, whether it's uncles, whether it's older brother type figures, whether it's grandfather, whether it's reaching out to a friend's husband in the community and saying, can you, can you mentor my, my child, this, particularly my son? Because boys, especially at the age of 11, 12, by that time, they need male mentors. They definitely need male mentors. And a lot of times, um, they can't, they can't even hear things from their own dad that they can hear from other male mentors. So a lot of benefit in male mentorship. And this is an incident a friend of mine witnessed. She was at a big conference, one of those it's not a you know, you know I guess type type of conferences. I'm not saying it's that one, but she was at one of those, and there was a, a famous uh, Muslim male figure uh, who was up on stage. And um, somebody in the audience asked a parenting question, and the male figure on stage started to answer it, answer the question. But then somebody else in the audience stood up and said, how can you answer that question? You were never around when you were growing up. And she said it was a, it was a very heartbreaking uh, moment and very awkward to witness. But there's a lot of truth in that because so many times we're so focused on giving back to the community and giving to the ummah, inshallah, and inshallah, inshallah, may everyone be rewarded for their noble intentions, but we can't neglect our own homes. We can't neglect our own families, particularly fathers, who sometimes can get so spread thin giving to everybody else that their own children um, can get neglected in the home. And, um, okay, so in conclusion, how am I doing on time? Ten minutes, okay. So in conclusion, I I just want to share that, you know, I love to-do lists. I love checklists. I love those BuzzFeed articles that say, you know, top ten things, whatever, you do this and you'll get these results. But I, I know more than anyone else that that's not how parenting works. Parenting isn't like you do A, B, C, and you'll get X, Y, Z results. It's, you know, first and foremost, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy for any success that anybody sees in their lives. Um, we know that prophets were tested with their children. You know, Prophet Nuh Islam, Prophet Adam Islam, Prophet Yaqub Islam. And these were the most pious men. These were people who were in direct communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were still tested with children who didn't believe and didn't practice and disobeyed them and disobeyed Allah. So sometimes, Sometimes uh, Allah SWT will test us with our children just to show us that this isn't for you. You can do everything quote unquote right and you're still not going to see the results that you want. It still doesn't absolve us from learning and it behooves us to learn from people who came before us and to learn from their mistakes and to learn from their success stories and try to implement the advice that we can implement. And all we can do is take the means, right? The end is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know of a mom, I know of a mom who did everything right. She did everything, that she could have written this article, every single one of these things that I went over today, she had in her life with her children. But still, when her son was in college, one day he called her and he said, I'm not praying anymore. And he told her, I'm not feeling the deen. That's how he worded it. He said, I'm not feeling the deen, and I'm not praying anymore. And when she told me, she told me very calmly, like this was the latest update. And I was a young mom, and I was not very subtle, not, not very thoughtful. And I just kind of blurted out, like, oh my God, why aren't, you, why aren't you freaking out? Why aren't you freaking out? Your son is telling you that he's not praying anymore. How can you like just announce this news so calmly? And she said, because I have a high opinion of my Lord. She said, I, from day one, have been doing du'a for my children. I've been doing du'a for their akhirah. I've been doing du'a for their iman. I've been doing 
people out there to get food. And I don't think those laws just disappeared into thin air. I don't I know that those laws were heard and inshallah they'll be answered, but they'll be answered in Allah's time. They won't be answered in my time. So and I am comfortable knowing that on the day of judgment, inshallah, I can tell Allah I did everything that was asked of me. Everything that you commanded that I was supposed to teach my children, I did. So and now my son has his own journey. He has his own ups and downs that he has to go through in life and choices he has to make and consequences he has to face. But I did what was asked of me. So all I can do now is continue to do love for my child. There's nothing more powerful than a parent's voice. We're all witnesses to that. And all I can do is keep an open door. And that's what she did. She and her husband continued keeping an open door, continued welcoming their son home, loving him. They kept moving forward with their other children. They kept practicing the need. They kept living their life the way it was meant to be lived. They didn't stop for their son. And he was welcome to join them, but they made it clear we're moving forward with or without. And I'm happy to report that he eventually did not come back. Took some time, but he came back to the dean, and he even did makeup prayers to make up for the time that he wasn't praying. So you can't despair. Despairing is haram in our religion. And so all we can do is take the means and be grateful that we are not held accountable for the results. We're only held accountable for what we did to facilitate our children's success and trauma. So I'm going to end with the dua from the Holy Quran. I'm going to read the English translation of it. It's from Surah 14, Ayah 40. O oh my Lord, make me one who establishes regular prayer, and also raise such among my offspring. O oh our Lord, and accept thou my prayer. O oh our Lord, cover us with thy forgiveness, me, my parents, and all believers, on the day that the reckoning will be established.